title that An Introduction to Your Soul. This morning, I'm mainly going to be talking about God. And then next week, we'll be talking about prayer as a way of doing business with God. Now, I'm sure you recognize that in these three topics, just about everything is contained. And um, so I'm going to try to be selective and focus on the things which seem to me might be most helpful. And I want to use again, or a parallel passage actually, to the one I used last time. The last passage, last time I used a passage in Mark, in which Jesus is talking about what shall a man give in exchange for their soul? What is a soul worth? And indicates that if you were able to exchange your soul for everything in the world, you would have gotten cheated. It is very difficult for us to conceptualize the worth of a soul. It is especially difficult for us today. The process of history and teaching and thought has leached out of our minds the very things we need to think about what a soul is. And I have no, really, no hopes of restoring that completely by taking 45 minutes and talking to you about it. But I do hope to get you on the path to filling out the idea of a soul. And the soul is matched by God. God stands over against the soul, and this morning I want to talk to you about the way that God alone is sufficient for the soul. Now you have to understand what a soul is first before you can get going on the second topic. And I want to use this morning Luke, the ninth chapter, if you turn with me to that. The wording here is a little different in a helpful way, in a way that I want to get into when we come to talk about God in a moment. But basically the situation here is well represented. It's the same situation. The situation in which Peter has just confessed that, that Jesus is indeed the anointed one. Uh, what that really means is he's the one with the solution. When you say Jesus is the Christ, you mean he's anointed. That's what Christ means, anointed. But that means that he's the one with the solution. You know, you see the slogan, Christ is the answer. And if you can understand what the question is, rightly, you'll know that he is. But when we say Jesus is the Christ, he's the Messiah, we're saying he's the one that's got it. What you need, he has. What the world needs, he has. He is the one who has come into the world with the solution. And when Peter recognized him as the one with the solution, that was a great moment. And it was a moment which Jesus, as a teacher, could not miss. Because, you see, a part of the essential need of humanity is to get turned around in their thinking about what is needed. They're over here busily saving their lives, they think. And all the while, their lives are slipping between their fingers. And the problem is that they've got a wrong conception of their life. So now watch this reading. Verse 23. Jesus begins to correct the misapprehensions about life. And he says, if any man will come after me, Luke 9, 23, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, folks, I'll give you an absolute recipe for liberation. That's it right there. You want to be free? You want to know what it is like to walk into the life which everyone dreams is right for humanity? This is it. This is it. Come after me, deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. 
For what is a man advantage if he gains the whole world and lose himself? And the differences in formulation here are good because it doesn't say lose his soul, it says lose himself. And one of the things we have to understand is that we are a soul. As I said to you last time, we only have a soul in the sense that we, the peculiar sorts of beings we are, we are in charge of our soul, at least for a while. And of course, we lose our souls in many ways. Many people lose them to their neighbors. Others lose them to work. Others lose them to security or wealth or some sort of adventurous life or romance or whatever. In many ways, you can lose your soul. Jesus catches it all up in the one phrase, whosoever would save his life shall lose it. You see, he's referring to the tendency of people to try to take charge of their soul as they should, but on their own. The way you take charge of your soul as you should is to give it to God, to live in his world. Stop trying to be God with God as your executive secretary. Reverse the roles and allow God to redefine who you are. Let me just play on that a moment. I said last time that the life which we are to lose, and in this language of this passage we can say the self which we are to deny, is the one that has been handed to us by the world when it said, here you are, Tom, here you are, Bill, here you are, Betty, here you are, this is who you are. You say, well, yes, okay, I'm it, and you're off and running. The world defines you, and then you start to work on it, and you figure out how you're going to do this. See. And you take charge, and you are the ultimate in your life. See, that's what the world says to you. It says you're ultimate. And it victimizes you, and you want to be ultimate, and you try to win, and you lose your life. And the only way to be that, to beat that, is to allow God to redefine who you are in his kingdom. He goes on to talk about being ashamed. And he talks about those who are ashamed of him and says, I'm going to be ashamed of them when I come in my glory. Why is he going to be ashamed? Don't rush off and say, well, you're going to be lost. Now, being ashamed is being ashamed. Sometimes you're ashamed of your kids, but you don't disinherit them, right? They're ashamed of you sometimes, but you're still their parent. So all he's saying is, look, people who in this age are ashamed to be aligned with me in the light of all that they are not ashamed to be aligned with, I'm going to be ashamed of them because, boy, are they dense. Were they foolish? Find a person who is... And, you know, I hesitate to talk about these things because they've been abused. People have been abused with them. and There's been so much legalism about it. But you find a person who is ashamed to be simply known as a Christian where they were or in their neighborhood. They're ashamed of it. You see, that just shows that the light isn't on them. They don't understand the kind of choice they're making. And they may feel right at home with people who are not ashamed to do the most sinful and the most foolish things you can imagine. And they feel right at home. Right at home. See, that's because in the depths of their soul there is so much that is still simply a part of the world. 
that said it can stop. And they haven't gotten over that need to identify with a world which has defined them in such a way that they are bound to lose their lives. And that's why Jesus talks about shame. And he gives us a little picture now that will lead us over into talking about God in just a moment. In, or he gives us a little hint and then great experience. In verse 27 of Luke 9, he says, after speaking about being ashamed and you need to tie all of this in very carefully, I tell you the truth, there are some standing here which will not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. Circle the word see. They're going to see it. All right? Now, just keep going. And it came to pass, about eight days after these sayings, he took Peter, John, and James. They were some who were standing there. Do you understand that? Peter and James and John were some who were standing there. And he went up on a mountain to pray. Now watch this verse. As he prayed, the fashion, the shape of his face became different. What is this incident called in the Gospels? Anyone? Transfiguration. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. And it really made an impression on Peter and the other. You find Peter referring to this in his letters later on. See, Jesus knew what he was doing. He was leading these people into a, an experience of seeing that which would help them not be ashamed once they got their minds around it. As he prayed, the fashion of his face was changed. And his clothing was white and glistening. Some of you have a New International Version. It says flashing like lightning. Or white as a flash of lightning. Now you've recently seen some lightning, haven't you? Right? Would you keep that vividly in mind as you read this verse? I think of, uh, of someone... Suppose my face were to suddenly begin to change. And all of a sudden, uh, don't worry, it won't happen. But all of a sudden, my clothing began to glisten. And just think for a moment, suppose for a moment, that it actually became as bright as one of those lightning bolts that you saw the other evening. And as he prayed... The fashion of his countenance was changed, and his raiment was white and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elijah, Elias, who appeared, now the old version says, in glory. New American Standard says, splendor. Your NIV says, glorious splendor. What it means is, they appeared glowing glowing. They appeared gloriously. You see, their persons had been liberated from the restraints which we live in, the side of the veil. They could appear as what they were. And they glowed and remember, the first part of the word glory is G-L-O, glow. Talk, we joke about people glowing in the dark. But the reality of God is glory. He appears in glory. Jesus, in the moment of his association with God, his Father, here on the mount, a little bit of the veil was pulled. Now, you see, the whole creation is waiting for that to happen to you as a child of God. Skip over with me to Romans 8.
and in Romans 8. I'll want to work a little bit with this passage later, so hold your finger there, but for the time being, um, look at verse 18 and follow. I'm sorry, 17. Let's go with 17. If we are children of God, then we are the heirs of God. We are the ones, what is an heir? An heir is someone who is going to receive something. Isn't that right? To say we are an heir of God is to say we're going to receive something. Moses and Elijah had already received something when they appeared with Jesus in glory. If children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Jesus Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified with him. For I reckon that the sufferings, I reckon means according to my reckoning. The sufferings of the present time are not worthy to be compared with the, In other words, we don't even sit around thinking, now is this worth it? They're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed where? Somebody tell me. Where is it going to be revealed? In us. Who's us? That's right. You. In us. For the earnest expectation of creation waits for the manifestation of the children of God. The manifestation of the children of God. See, you are in waiting. There is a purpose for you being in waiting. But you are in waiting. And the whole world, which has been deprived of the rule of God, because we have stepped aside and decided to run our own lives, and God, of course, respects that, if you want to run your life, he'll let you do it. Because we have stepped aside, all of creation is subjected to vanity. Now, if you take the modern outlook on humanity, say, well, how could this possibly be? Because we are not very significant. We just sort of flotsamed and jetsamed up on the flow of genes and proteins and all kinds of crud that's floating around on the earth. But look at what he said. The earnest expectation of creation or the creature waits for the manifestation of the children of God. Will you please think about what that means for who you are as a person, as a soul? Will you think about that? Now, I don't have time this morning to talk about the many, many passages in the New Testament where it speaks of God's children ruling the earth with Jesus. There's just too much here to touch on, so I have to just appeal to you. Will you please think about what this means for who you are? Because nearly everyone has just had the stuffing beaten out of them. And they are downcast and depressed. And they try to go get someone to pump them up with talking about self-esteem or something. And they go to one cheerleading session or another. It may be a church. It may be Scientology. L. Ron Hubbard. Or some other person. Eberhard. Or, you know, a million gurus floating down the road trying to make a buck to pump us up. Think about the meaning of this for who you are. For the creature was made subject to vanity. Not really. Creation did not choose to present the scene that you see as you look out upon it in history. 
you peer through the little tube and you see Kuwait and Hussein and all of the other mad and not so mad and bad and not so bad and good and poor and deprived. Why is that mess out there? Because the children of God have not yet been revealed. They were meant to make it work. And that's what your soul is like. It's the sort of thing which can make it work once you understand your relationship to God. For the creature was made subject to vanity not willing, but by reason of him, God, who has subjected the same creation to, to whom? To you, in hope. You understand? The creature is subjected to us, to human beings, under God in hope. We got out from under God. Christ comes to bring us back under God. And all things will be restored in him. And you have the choice of what your part is going to be in that now and later. That's your choice. That's what you keep in mind when you read the verse now. What shall a person give in exchange for their soul? Can you remember that? That's what you're choosing. See, when I asked last time how many sparrows you're worth, I didn't want anyone to answer because I, had a, I was sure that many people would be probably pretty seriously in doubt about whether they would be worth 25. Because you see, we've been so beaten by this idea that we're just this helpless little victim that is thrown on their own and has to take charge and in taking charge can only lose. Now, if we had time this morning, we could do a lot of work in Romans 8 about the mind and the flesh and the mind of the spirit. Or in Galatians 6. They that sow to the flesh shall of the flesh reap what? Corruption. What is corruption? That means everything falls apart. <laughs> okay, That's what corruption means. It falls apart. Uh, you see a dead cat out on the road here. You watch it long enough, you'll see it all falls apart. That's corruption. That's corruption. Right. Or you drive a brand new Cadillac out into the middle of the field and come back 15 years later, you will see what has happened to it. Even if nobody touched it. Sometimes this is called entropy in physics. It's what you experience when you watch your face in the mirror over many years. You see entropy taking place. Disorganization, if you wish. See, that's a law of the physical world. Now that's, you see, when Paul says, they that sow to the flesh shall reap corruption, please get this. He's saying exactly the same thing as Jesus said when he said, if you seek to save your life, you will lose it. Exactly the same thing is being said. Demystify it and understand it. But they that sow to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap what? Undying life. Never comes apart. He that loseth his life for my sake and the Gospels shall pray. Now, try to remember that, okay? Try to understand what's going on. It's the choice between running your life, which will fail. Because in you, if you are going to run your life on your own, all you have to count on is what you got. We were talking with Jay the other day about his teeth. He's got good teeth. He's got teeth that make dentists moan. Why does he have them? Well, as I said to him, the secret to life is choose your parents well. 
Yeah. <laughs> Them genes are very important, aren't they? Yeah. So you come in this world, you've got a set of genes. And you've got a limited amount of stuff. And life has dealt you a hand. Okay? And your challenge is to play that hand triumphantly. And you say, well, I didn't want to be this, and I didn't want to be that. I know, you know what happened to me, and you know what I did. It's all over. Yeah? There is no redemption in the flesh. The flesh just means your natural abilities or your natural powers. See, if you're some great big bruiser and you can make a hit as a football player or a, a movie a magnet or something of that sort, well, you'll sail for a while. But... Look at Elizabeth Taylor. Right? It all goes that way. That is what is called the way of all flesh. The way of all flesh. Now, over against that stands God. And with God, you're able to reinterpret and redefine your project. Now, you really, you know, the soul... I, I can't emphasize too strongly how great the soul is in itself. And even apart from God, if you, if you just let yourself know your soul, you're bound to be impressed. We don't do that much now. It used to be much more common. There was a poet by the name of W. Henley who wrote a poem called Invictus. Some of this you will know because it has become a part of the language. And I want to read it to you because it expresses such a different attitude than you are apt to hear today. Listen to this. This man was an invalid most of his life. Out of the night that covers me, black as a pit, from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. You will not find these words put to rock music nowadays. We're not into thinking of ourselves as unconquerable, as indestructible. But we are. We're more apt to experience the ravages of soul. Some of you watched this tape by Robert Bly, and he uses the poem by Antonio Machado. It goes like this. The wind one brilliant day calls to my soul with an odor of jasmine. And the wind said, in return for the odor of my jasmine, I'd like all the odor of your roses. But I said, I have no roses. All the flowers of my garden are dead. And then the wind said, well, I will take the withered petals and the yellow leaves. And the wind left, and I wept. And I said to myself, what have you done with the garden that was entrusted to you? You see the difference between the two? And they, they express a difference of attitude, and we live in a world that by and large experiences the soul entirely in the way of the second poem. Because we experience the ravages that time has taken and the failures because we don't see our soul in relation to God. Now, let's think about God for a few minutes.
I hope we've had a little introduction to our soul. I hope that you have begun to think about yourself this morning. Think about your soul as a world. And I guarantee you that if you ex learn to explore your soul, you will find that it, like the world, has horizons beyond which you never manage to get. It's that vast, it's that big. It's designed for God. But the soul can be lost. It can be lost. And its only way of being saved is to tie onto God. Now, both last time and this time, a part of my problem in speaking to you is that there's a real danger that I will lapse into language that will be, you will think, as merely intellectual or something of that sort, or philosophical, and just not be able to follow along. But you see, the soul and God are not ordinary objects. We're not talking about bicycles and uh, automobiles and accidents and birthday cakes and things of that sort. So we have to understand that even the Bible uses language about God that requires some attention. In Exodus 3, When God meets Moses in the burning bush, and God speaks to Moses and says to him, Now you go back down into Egypt and lead my people out because I see their suffering. Moses wants to know who am I going to tell them sent me? Am I going to go down there and say, Do you know a burning bush sent me? Now, that might be impressive, but not for long. And so, in verse 11, Moses is reasoning with God. And finally he says, verse 13, When I come to the children of Israel and say unto them, The God of your fathers has sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? Now, that's the same question as, Who is this God of our fathers? Who is he? What is his name? And God says to Moses, I am because I am. That's my name. Now the Hebrew word Yahweh is actually derived from the verb Haya, which means to be. Don't leave me yet. Hang on. Okay. What is God saying? God is saying, you tell them that the one who sent you is one who is absolutely sufficient unto himself to be. It doesn't depend on anything else. Everything else depends on him. And translators will struggle with this. But really what it is saying is God is identifying himself as one who is totally independent of anything else. He is sufficient unto himself. Now why is that important? Because you must understand that the souls, the sufficiency of God alone to your soul is based upon his sufficiency, period. Think about it. The sufficiency of God alone to you as an undying, immortal soul is based upon who he is in himself. See, John, the fifth chapter, the 26th verse, Jesus is here talking about his ability to give eternal life to others. And you want to understand the connection now in these verses that go before, wonderful verses that we use to help other people understand what they do in trusting Christ. He that believeth on him hath sent me hath everlasting life. And so, what is everlasting life? Everlasting life is life which simply doesn't come apart. It's there forever. Now, verse 25. The hour is coming when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. 
Verse 26 now is where I want you to tie this in with Exodus 3, 14. For as the Father hath life in himself, so he has given to the Son to have life in himself. The Father has life in himself. The Father has life in himself. You look around you at the physical universe. Where did it come from? The one thing you know is it came from something. It is not the kind of thing which doesn't come. Everything you find came from something else. It doesn't matter whether you slice it in space or in time or in both. You will always find that the physical world is a world in which there is dependency on other things. Now what that really means is, and I'm not going to hit you with the argument, but just give you the conclusion, and I'll be glad to discuss the argument with anyone who wants to go over the details. And what that really means is, as the Bible recognizes, is that there is a being which doesn't come from anywhere. There is a being which is self-sufficient. And when you come down to living your life, you have to choose whether you're going to live from that being or you're going to live in terms of beings which are dependent. That's your choice between the flesh and the spirit. That's your choice. So many verses that show the result of that choice. Psalm 121 is a favorite verse of many people. When they uh, come to their prayer time, they often use this verse. Listen to what it says. And you need, to, you need some of your translations will do this right. The older, the, most of the versions actually don't quite get it right because it talks as if I were going to lift up my eyes under the hills. Listen to what it says. I will lift up mine eyes under the hills from whence cometh my help. Put a question mark after it. I will lift up my eyes under the hills. That's where the idolaters were lifting up their eyes. That's what the meaning of the high places in Israel was. Question mark. I will lift up my eyes under the hills. From whence cometh my help? My help comes from the Lord who made the hills. Not only the hills, but the heavens and the earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. That's okay. You can move it. He's not talking about you can't move it. He's saying he will not cause you to be knocked off your feet. Put it like that, okay? He won't let you be knocked off your feet. He that keeps you will not go to sleep on the job. You know, the lady who said, when I go to bed at night, I turn it all over to God because he's going to be up anyway. She got that out of the song. Then he's going to sleep. So you can go to sleep. The Lord is your protector. The Lord is your shade upon your right hand. The sun will not smite you by day, nor the moon by night. Now this was written in a time when the moon and sun were not quite, and this isn't talking about sunburn or moonburn. The Lord will preserve you from all evil. How much evil does that leave out? The Lord will preserve you from all evil. Remember this when you study or you use meditatively the Lord's Prayer this coming week. He will preserve your soul. He will preserve you. He will preserve your life. He will preserve what matters about us. The Lord will preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. You know the sufficiency of God to your soul when you place the Lord before you and keep him there in your mind. That is why the spiritual disciplines that were being spoken about a while ago are so important. They are ways of getting your mind fixed on God. Psalm 16.8 says, I have placed the Lord always before me. 
He is at my right hand. Therefore, I shall not be moved. I'll not be moved. We place the Lord before us. We trust and rely upon God to deal with the issues that face us. This is also called in the Bible waiting on the Lord. You wait on the Lord. And that moves you from the domain of thought, which is very important. Because if you don't place the Lord always before you, you know what else is going to be before you? What else is going to be before you is all of the stuff around you that's going to victimize you. And temptation is not just in the form of temptation to sin, but trials of all kinds. And you will be defeated just because you have a flat tire. See, Now the opposite of that is seen in James the first chapter. Count it all joy when you fall into all kinds of troubles. Why is that do you suppose? That is because for the one who has set the Lord always before them, the troubles are an occasion to know the reality of the hand of God in their life. That is to know the sufficiency of God to their lives. Now see, most folks just kind of sit back and they don't want to try that. You know, they're like, they're like someone who knows that if they'll go jump in the water in just a few seconds it'll be comfortable. But it's going to be very painful until it becomes comfortable. And so they just stand back or they'll walk down and make sure that they get goosebumps all the way up every inch of their body, inch by inch, as they inch into the pond or whatever it is they're swimming instead of just jumping in. And that the call of Jesus, the radical call of Jesus to lose your life for his sake is the call to jump in to the sea of God. Trust it. And then finally... We know the sufficiency of God to our soul, not just by place keeping him before our mind, not just by trusting him in action, but by the interaction within our souls and around us that assures us completely that we have a new reality in him. You can't get that by talking about it. You get it by trusting and living in the way of Christ. And as you do that, you know through your experience that there is nothing that can happen where God will not be sufficient to you. We hear today, Irene has brought the request for a young woman who has received word that she has cancer spread to her lungs. The telephone call comes and says, your child has been injured. You're going to walk your mate to his or her grave, or she's going to walk you there. All of these times of trial, you become old, you become invalid. I want to tell you now, that you can know the reality of God to your soul that is so great that it will not matter what happens to you. And you can know that if you will learn to accept your life as the place in which God has chosen to dwell and manifest himself. Listen to these words from Amy Carmichael, a wonderful woman who learned the reality that I'm talking about. Before the winds that blow do cease, teach me to dwell within thy calm. Before the pain has passed in peace, give me, my God, to sing a song. Let me not lose the chance to prove the fullness of enabling love. O oh, love of God, 
do this for me, maintain a constant victory. See, that is eternal life. That is the knowledge of the sufficiency of God to the soul. And I've tried very briefly in these two sessions to place on the one hand your soul as a great, indestructible, magnificent creation of God. And on the other hand, a great, indestructible, magnificent God that is made for your soul. Your soul is made for God. And if we can rise above all of the failures, all the harm, all the hurt, and simply cast ourselves upon God where we are, we will know the sufficiency that makes us able to glorify God in everything that comes to us. That puts us together and makes us of one piece. And then we're ready to go into business with God, which we're going to talk about next time. But what I want to leave you with today is the simple thought that if you will turn your mind to God and wait on Him in everything, and where you find yourself unable to do that, learn how to do it. You will be able to stop the avalanche of sin and failure which continues to defeat people because you will have found the rock, the eternal rock in connection with which you can say not with bravado but with simple confidence I have enough. I have enough. An old song we used to sing says, I entered once a home of care, old age and penury, poverty were there, yet peace and joy with all. I asked the widowed mother whence her ancient widowhood's defense. And she answered, Christ is all. Christ is all. And that song goes on in that theme. You see, that's the sufficiency of life. That's the water of life. That Jesus said to the woman at the well, I'll give you water and you'll never thirst again. Lord, teach us in our hearts to know the reality that we are as your creations, that you are as our creator. Help us to get a glimmer, perhaps a little glimmer like James and Peter and John got there on the mountain, of the glory that is breaking around the shadows of our lives. Every individual here this morning minister to their hearts and souls the truth of your gospel. Amen. Good dismissed.